All right, welcome everybody to today's Midday Science Cafe, our first Midday Science Cafe of the new year. So it's so great to have you. This is a collaboration between UC Berkeley Science at Cal and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We have two scientists, once from each institution, Dr. Federico Munch and Dr. Bhavna Aurora. And it's so exciting. We're gonna go ahead and get started the way we always do with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the histor historic and sovereign band, Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and Broad Broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you for allowing me to uh, say that. Uh, our, we have two, as you're aware, we do these every month on the Thursdays at noon, the third Thursdays. Our next one is March 17th. So write these down and make sure uh, to be uh, added to both the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and Science at Cal's listserv to register for these events. But we will be um, speaking about the science of meat and dairy alternatives on March 19th and on April 21st, recyclable, recyclable plastics um, in time for Earth Day or Earth Week. Um, as a reminder, science at Cal, next slide, celebrate science. We bring the wonder and excitement of UC Berkeley STEM research to the community. All of our events are, and programs are free and geared towards public audience. I didn't say this yet, but my name is Jan Rossiter and I am the executive director of Science at Cal. Next slide, please. In 2008, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise awareness and understanding and appreciation of scientific research at UC Berkeley. To realize this vision, we engaged the vast Berkeley STEM community um, as science communicators to foster creative collaboration amongst campus and amongst our community partners. We share, who share our, our, um, our commitment to equity, inclusion, and engagement in STEM. So we're so excited to be here. Before I pass things along to Berkeley Lab, I just wanted to say a few things. One is that there is closed captioning. If you push the live transcript button or the CC button or the three buttons in the lower bottom panel of your um, Zoom meeting, you'll be able to uh, see those. Uh, remember to add your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. Either way, we'll find them. You don't need to do both. Uh, just one is fine. And lastly, this event will be recorded. So don't worry, you'll be able to send it to friends and family after the event. So now I will hand things over, excuse me, to Jocelyn Delgado from Berkeley Lab. Thanks, Dee. Hi, everyone. My name is Jocelyn Delgado, and I'm the Community Relations Administrator at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And just to give you a quick refresher, uh, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. We're supported by DOE's Office of Science and are managed by the University of California. And all of our research uh, is unclassified. And since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab's been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Uh, today, uh, Berkeley Labs researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions, create useful new materials, advance the frontiers of computing, and probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills above the UC Berkeley campus, and our close ties to the UC system creates a unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses as either students, postdocs, and professors with joint appointments at the lab. And as you can imagine, Berkeley Lab's relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary scientific research 
from both of our institutions. So we hope you enjoyed today's presenta presentation on deep earth geology. Thank you so much and deep back to you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. So right now we are gonna hand things over to Federico. I am going to introduce him. So Dr. Federico Munch studied geophysics at the National University of La Plata in Argentina. In 2015, he moved to Switzerland to pursue his doctoral studies in geophysics in Zurich. In 2020, he's been a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. He's interested in understanding how temperature and composition changes in the Earth's mantle. In particular, he makes use of changes in the magnetic field of the planet and how the energy released during an earthquake travels across the Earth to create images of the Earth's interior between 30 to 1,000 kilometers in depth with the ultimate goal of understanding how deep mantle circulation relates to plate tectonics and surface volcanism. And we're gonna learn all about what that means in his talk right now. So we're so excited to, to have you here, Fede, and take it away. Thanks, Lee. So hello, everyone. My name is Fede, like FedEx, but without the X. And as you mentioned, I'm a postdoc at the Earth and Planet Science Department. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about water in the Earth's mantle. So as you might remember from your geography classes, the Earth has layers like a beach, a core, a mantle, and a crust. So the outermost layer, called the crust, is divided into pieces, like a puzzle. Uh, we call those pieces tectonic plates. And those pieces, they are moving, moving with respect to each other. So for example, we know that North America and Europe, they are separating roughly 10 centimeters per, per year. And so the movement of these plates is what generates the, volcan the, sorry, the earthquakes that we um, the experience on the Earth's surface, as well as the volcanic activity. Um, and we know that essentially the, so the movement of these plates is driven actually by movements in the Earth mantle. So the mantle, the, inter the, mid the intermediate layer, uh, is moving extremely slowly at the same rate as your nails grow. Uh, but that movement is enough to actually generate all these very interesting processes that we see on the surface. Now, um, numerical simulations of how the mantle moves they show that it is necessary to have a small amount of water in the Earth's mantle in order to maintain plate tectonics, so to have earthquakes and volcanoes. And you might wonder why. So imagine you are if you're making pizza dough, right? So if you don't put enough water, then it's actually very hard to deform the material, to, to mix the dough, right? So it means that the, the, the material is very viscous. Now, as you increase the amount of water, you reduce the viscosity, which makes, which makes the material much more easy to deform. So essentially, for the water, for the earth, there is a kind of like an intermediate point in which there is uh, enough water to maintain these plate tectonics. Um, and for example, we, we actually, we, we suspect that both Mars and Venus, they run out of uh, this water in the earth's mantle uh, because we don't observe active plate tectonics nowadays. So the question is why does earth still have it? And you know, where is this water now? First, I, you might be thinking, wait a minute, are you saying that there are channels of water flowing inside the Earth's mantle? And so at least where I had to add a disclaimer and actually not, we're not really thinking about liquid water, we're just thinking about essentially hydrogen that is in the structure of the rocks, the minerals that form the Earth's mantle. Uh, and we are talking about very little amounts, but that's enough to affect the, you know, the mechanical properties of, of the mantle. Now, the question is, how do we study the Earth's interior? You can say, oh, that's easy, just dig a hole. But actually, the deepest hole that we ever, that there is on Earth, is only is roughly eight miles uh, deep, but the Earth's radius is roughly 4,000 miles. So essentially, we are barely scratching the surface. So as an alternative, we can look at rock, um, at mantle rocks and, and minerals, which act as a window to the Earth's interior. So what, what have we learned from studying rocks? So first of all, we know that the, the mantle is not one single layer, but we could actually divide it into upper mantle, which is roughly 2,250 miles thick, a transition zone, and lower mantle. Um, and we also know that water gets out of the mantle in volcanically active regions, such as the Mid-Ocean Ridge, which is this place in the middle of the ocean where we are generating a new crust, which means that the plates are moving with respect to each other. Um, and so as these plates they move, they encounter other plates, and one of them gets underneath the other one. We call that a subduction zone. Um, and we know that as one of the plates subducts underneath the other one, part of the water is gonna get essentially released, 
triggering volcanism, volcanic activity, but part of the water is going to continue traveling down inside the mantle. So also we know that from chemical analysis of mantle rocks, we expect actually the upper mantle to be relatively dry, meaning it has less than 0.01% of water, um, whereas we expect the transition zone to be like a sponge, so to have up to 1-2% of water. And actually we don't know how much water is in the lower mantle. That's still an, an open question. Um, so the other thing that actually we know is there is one diamond um, that carried material from the transition zone from 3,300 miles deep, sorry. And that uh, diamond actually had 1.5% of water. You can think that you know, this diamond essentially took a, a picture, a snapshot of the conditions that it was formed. Um, and we know that the mantle you know, at that particular location has 1.5% 1, 1 of water. Now, the question is, Okay, there is one place on Earth where the transition zone has a lot of water. Now, is this a global feature or is it just a local uh, feature that we are observing? And depending on that, you know, then the next question that pops up is, okay, but what's, what's the amount of water that is in the mantle? And then how does it move between you know, these, up, these different reservoirs, between the upper mantle, the transition zone, the lower mantle, how long does it take? Um, so to study or to try to attempt to answer these questions, this is where geophysical techniques come into play. Um, and to introduce them just briefly, just think for a second that they give you an egg and I ask you, is this egg rotten, raw or boiled? But you need to, uh, you need to figure out the answer to this question without cracking it. You cannot open it. So how do you do that? How do you find out if the egg is rotten, raw or boiled without opening it? Someone can say, oh, that's just easy. You know, get a glass of water. If the, if the egg sinks, then I know that it's not rotten. And if the egg floats, I know that it's rotten. So let's say we do the experiment in this case, and we found out that the egg is not rotten. But still, we don't know whether it's raw or boiled. So we ask another friend, and he tells us, oh, that's also easy. Just you know, take the egg, spin it, and then if it, if it moves fast, then we know that it's boiled. If it moves slowly, we know that it is raw. So let's, in this case, let's say we, did the, we do the experiment, and we find out that the egg is boiled. So actually, with the Earth, we are doing the exact same thing. So we are making measurements at the surface. And as we cannot crack, we cannot go deep inside the Earth. We use those measurements to try inferences uh, or to try to understand what is happening in the Earth's interior. So one way or one technique that we have to do that is by analyzing the way the ground moves when there is an earthquake. So when there is an earthquake, there is energy that gets released. And that energy travels inside the Earth's mantle. And so what we do is we listen at how the ground moves in different phases. Uh, and by looking at that, uh, at the movement, we can infer what is underneath. You can think of if you're, if you're, you know, if you're jumping on a bed or on a table, the, the movement is going to be different, right? So the same actually happens in the Earth. So by looking at, at these waves, we can create maps of how, how fast or slow these waves travel inside the Earth. So what you see, for example, here in, in the map on the right, uh, if you see this line, this red line, um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's actually a region where these waves travel uh, slower, and it's associated to what we were talking before, how, the, how North America and Europe, they are separating. So that's one way you have to study the Earth. Another way to study the Earth, that we have to study the Earth is by looking at the magnetic field. So as you, my, as you know, the compass points to the North because the Earth has a magnetic field, which is like a shield, essentially, that protects us from particles and radiation that comes from the sun. Now, the, there are small ch changes uh, in the Earth's magnetic field uh, through time um, and space. And by looking at those changes, essentially, we can create maps of how the electrical conductivity changes as a function of depth and, and in different locations. So you see here is an example of something I'm working on in the, in the US. And when you can think of this, so the, the the red colors, they show you regions where the electrical conductivity is high, which you can think that is regions where the mantle is hotter. Right? Now, the same, the same uh, as with the egg, actually, when we, might, when we make one observation, for example, how the seismic waves change, we can actually explain them by different reasons. We can explain a change in seismic wave velocities or because of the temperature change or some change in composition. And actually, the same happens with electrical conductivity. It can be due to temperature, or it can also be, it can also reflect changes in water content. So actually, we need the same as with the egg, we need to combine these different techniques 
in order to isolate the specific effects. Right? So I spent four years uh, during my PhD in Switzerland uh, understanding these techniques and then trying to combine them. Um, so we were looking for essentially how temperature, composition, and water changes inside the mantle. And what we found is, um, is summarizing here. So essentially, we look at the stations in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Uh, and we found that the transition zone underneath Europe and Australia uh, seems to be relatively dry, and that it has less than 0.01% of, of water, whereas there seems to be more water in the transition zone underneath North America and Asia. Um, we also found uh, that the upper mantle is relatively dry, which is something that we already knew from analysis of rocks, which is a good sign because it means that our techniques are pointing in the right direction. Um, but the main, the main message that I want to give you today is that there is, so there is water in the Earth's mantle, specifically hydrogen, but it comes from, from the water that is in the oceans. Um, and the, the water is, is not, um, and there are variations of where the water is. Now, now the next question to try to understand is why the water is where it is. Um, and you might be wondering, okay, this is very interesting, but why should we keep studying this? And truth is that, so having knowledge on the structure and dynamics of the mantle will help us to better understand volcanically active regions. So why volcanic eruptions might happen in certain places, as well as tectonically active regions. And more importantly, the, even it, it might help us to, to actually understand the initiation of plate tectonics, when plate tectonics started, which is still an, an open question. And on a more naive note, you know, Earth is the only planet that we can call home nowadays. Um, and, you know, hopefully if we understand it better, we, we might be able to appreciate it better and take and potentially take better care of it. Okay. So with that, I just want to thank you for your time and yeah, go back to you. Thank you. You finished right as an emergency vehicle is passing by, so I tried to pause a little bit. <laughs> So I just want to remind everyone that was wonderful, Fede. So good. Thank you so much for the, the explanation of these events. So I know we have a chat box and we have a Q&A box. I want to remind folks to make sure throughout the entire presentation, um, both uh, Fede and Bhavna coming up, you are you can ask them as many questions as you like and we'll get to those. I'm going to ask Fede a few questions now before we hand it over to Bhavna. Um, so the first question is, um, so how about the water content underneath South America and Africa? What about that? Because I know we had well, you had shown that map and most of those spots were in North America, right? Well, that's actually a great question. Um, so the, 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 the short answer is we don't know what the water content is, uh, both in, in North America and sorry, in South America and, and Africa right now. And the reason is because we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have um, good enough stations to do this analysis. So the, especially when you're looking at, at, at changes in the magnetic field of the planet, you need very, very long time series, for example, like 10 or 15 years of measurements. Um, and you know, even though there are stations um, in, at least in a country in Argentina, because that's uh, where I grew up, um, you know, unfortunately, essentially, you know, when there are economic crises and, and, and different things, you know, the, the funding uh, in, in science can, can change. So when you look at those records, they're not always uh, continuous or, or the, station, the stations are not always well maintained. So it's great. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that plate tectonics doesn't happen there, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> or else maybe we'd all go there. <laughs> so where did the water even come from to begin with? That's a great question, actually. Um, so we, we think that the, the most accepted idea is that the water actually came from from asteroids and comets when the Earth was forming. Um, but essentially, the idea is that the, the, the water got formed like farther away in the solar system, but then it, it, it was brought up by extraterrestrial objects, essentially. Right? Uh, is, is one, one point that is effectively very interesting is that it's, we're still not sure when that water came. Um, there are people that they believe that all the water came um, after the moon was formed. Um, and other people think that um, it was it was more yeah it just it was coming all the time, um, but and that, that's actually still an, an open question. 
Ah, so uh, future area of study for any future scientists out there, some geoscientists. Um, <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Fede. We're going to hand things over to Jocelyn and Bhavna, and we will get to all of the questions in the Q&A um, at the end of the program. Thank you, Fede, for that great presentation. And now it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker to the screen, Dr. Bhavna Arora. Bhavna is the Carbon Removal and Mineralization Program Lead and a Research Scientist in the Energy Geosciences Division at Berkeley Lab. She received her PhD from um, Texas A&M University, where she studied the effects of subsurface hydrogeneity on modeling coupled hydrobiogeochemical processes. She came to the lab as a geochemical modeling postdoc in 2012. And since then, she has been involved in multiple Department of Energy projects and university collaborations. She currently heads an international early career effort focused on enhancing partnerships across a critical zone network of networks. Her specialty is in utilizing a combination of numerical models and data mining techniques to test new concepts and hypotheses and in applying these tools to providing a scientific basis for solving diverse issues in the earth and environmental sciences, such as environmental remediation, water quality, and management of agricultural soils. Bhavna, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that introduction, Jocelyn. Um, hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about nitrates and groundwater, the good and the bad of managed aquifer recharge. So why do we even care? Water scarcity is an increasing reality in many parts of the world. As you can imagine, you know, you might think we have so much water distributed on the earth, but a lot of that is salt water or seawater which is really not fit for human consumption. Um, the freshwater resources that currently exist, barring, you know, if you're thinking about uh, desalination opportunities from seawater, we are only left with about 2.5% of freshwater resources. And a lot of that is locked up in ice and glaciers. Groundwater forms a big component of that freshwater resource. So you might ask, you know, I see all these rivers and, you know, been doing uh, lakes, we've been out to the lakes, but they only compromise about 0.4% of that freshwater resource. So to sum up, freshwater resources are finite and limited. And the other thing is with increasing population, you can imagine that the demand of, for water is exceeding much, much fast. Uh, as opposed to the amount of water that we do have. Climate change is definitely worsening this problem. So you can see these are dramatic images of Lake Shasta uh, prior to the drought uh, that hit California for over five years. So this is imagery from 2011, uh, November 2011. And the same place, same site in November 2014 during the drought, you can actually see how much that water level has dropped. You can also see the same type of imagery for Lake Folsom during the drought and after a rainy season hit in December, 2016. So you can imagine how important those rain events are for recharging our lakes and surface waters. But what about groundwater? And what is groundwater? So I should define that first. Groundwater is the water found underground uh, beneath our feet in the cracks uh, within the soils. So groundwater has also been recorded using special imagery, and you can see the change in storage within that groundwater. So it's not invincible, right? <laughs> um, as you can see from this NASA imagery from 2002, we had really good, you know, it's green, it's filled up, really great groundwater storage. But as we moved uh, towards that drought in June 2014, it's quite red which means that we've lost a lot of that groundwater due to climate change, but also due to human consumption. So how does groundwater really recharge? You know, who's filling up that tank beneath our feet? Groundwater very much like surface water. You know, it's a key resource, but it has a capacity very similar to a reservoir. So you can imagine during rainy or wet years, 
that there are these natural pipes into the groundwater. So there are places within the, the earth's surface which are acting as these natural sources to recharge what's beneath the ground, you know, that aquifer or groundwater. But during drought years, we might expect those uh, recharge pipes to really drip down and have lower water to provide to uh, the groundwater. So we can imagine those levels dropping. And we've seen this happen quite frequently in California. So this is a graph that's showing rain or, or snowpack on December 29th for the same, uh, you know, the Lake Shasta kind of region. So within the past decades, you can see a lot of these graphs showing so many swings in, uh, you know, precipitation or the snowpack for each year. Um, but the most important thing or, or the high, highlight of this figure is that a lot of these years were below normal. So we're not providing sufficient uh, resources to fill up our groundwater basins. That means that, you know, uh, the amount of water that's in that reservoir, uh, in the aquifer, it can vary significantly over time. So how do we deal with this problem? A potential solution here is to think about managed aquifer recharge or, or MAR. So humans can help, right? What we can do is we can connect our surface water to that groundwater and create this pipe on our own to extract water from surface water and purposely fill that groundwater, especially during wet years. There are several different techniques uh, that can do this, like extract the water from surface and provide it to groundwater. One of them is also Agricultural Managed Aquifer Recharge or AGMAR. What that basically means, now we have the surface water resource and we're tapping into that resource and really uh, flooding, intentionally flooding crop lines. So providing that surface water um, during wet years and, and transferring that water from our rivers or lakes uh, onto our on-farm systems. Are there other ways to do this? Absolutely. And all of them have different costs and different technologies involved. A lot of these recharge may need some pre-processing of the water quality uh, to provide it, um, you know, to, to add this up to groundwater. But the key benefits to having Agmar is first, it's a really low cost, low energy water supply option. Second, you can think of this as a natural treatment. We are not doing you know, desalination or having new technologies uh, to, to replenish some of these overexploited groundwater systems, which as you can imagine, because these are agricultural systems, a lot of the water has been pumped out of those groundwater. It, uh, this particular technique also helps us reduce the water runoff that might happen from those surface waters just to oceans and that also creates algal bloom. So if we don't tap into the surface water resources, especially during wet years, it might just be picking up all of this debris, all of these nutrients, and we see these algal blooms uh, in our lakes and in our oceans. So it's preventing uh, that from happening. It also prevents against uh, evaporation losses uh, through the surface water because we're just uh, putting this water underground, uh, which doesn't have this direct sunlight uh, to create more evaporation losses. And as I said before, you know, if this is happening during wet years, uh, it's going to help us manage those water extremes and floods in the surface water supply. So it is kind of a flood control treatment, uh, and there is added benefit to adopting Agmar. And again, this can be scaled up over time. You can think of many, many on-farm uh, AGMAR systems uh, that provide additional benefits. Sorry about that. But there are some outstanding science questions. We don't know everything about AGMAR, especially you know, we, when we are thinking about applying this to croplands. One of the biggest questions is that on the croplands, we do have these fertilizer residues or nitrate in the system. 
you know, in, in a system without Agmar, you might think that nitrate is taken up by plants for which it was applied, right? You want your crops to grow, so you apply fertilizers, but only a part of it is taken up. A part of that is lost to the atmosphere and quite, you know, a lot of it is just stored within our soils and it can be transported to groundwater where it can act as a contaminant. So we have to be very careful what we are doing with these Agmar systems and ask the questions when we apply that on-farm, uh, you know, ponding or apply that water, what's going to happen to all of the stored nitrate? Are we just going to push all of that nitrate down to our groundwater and worsen our groundwater quality? And just to bring it uh, you know, come back to the point about where does California stand in all of this? So California implemented a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act back in 2014. And this emerged, you know, as we were emerging from a perfect hydrologic storm. We were coming out of five years of drought, which meant that there was less surface water that was being delivered uh, to people who needed it, especially in the Central Valley where we have our agricultural industry based. And what that meant was, you know, when there was less surface water being supplied, more groundwater was being pumped. So California came to the rescue and they said, we are going to be thinking about Agmar and these management practices. And this should become a recognized part of the solution that we're facing now, which is that our groundwater resources are really dwindling. So what am I doing in all of this? So our research group is really focused on a particular site within the Central Valley. As you probably know, the Central Valley is the most productive agricultural region in California. Uh, it contributes to about a $46 billion industry uh, for us and you know, for the nation as well. Um, so our site is located, uh, it's an almond field site in Modesto, California. And we applied the on-farm recharge so you can see the water being filled uh, on, on the field. And we're asking those outstanding science questions. So we are asking what's gonna to happen to that nitrate? Is it just you know, going down into our groundwater and uh, you know, messing with the quality of our groundwater? And you know, a lot of uh, factors go into evaluating, is Agmar really beneficial and not creating harmful situation, especially in thinking about the water quality? So what we did was the first question that we asked was, are there specific type of soils that are really good for Agmar that are not going to transport that nitrate deeper into our system? So soils can be of different types. And um, you know, I'm showing here things from medium sand, fine sand to silt and clay. And as you can see from the figure, it basically means sand is something that has large particle sizes, really big gaps uh, between the particles, as opposed to clay, which has small particle size and they're really close to each other. So the water holding capacity for clays is really high, as you can see from the blue in that image. Uh, but for sand, it means, you know, if you add water, it's just gonna go through those bigger gaps between those particles and just go down into your system. So it has a higher water drainage rate. And so that was our question, you know, which type of soils are going to be more suitable for Agmar? And our models found the answer. What we found was if we have fine textured soils like silt or clay, they're going to take their time. They're gonna transform that nitrate to a lesser contaminant and would have lesser losses to groundwater. So they're really good for Agmar. And you might ask the question, what's gonna happen if my soil was made up of all of sand and we're adding this, uh, you know, Agmar treatment, you know, are we screwed? And they do promote, so any sandy type of soils, they will promote more water flow and nitrate to the groundwater. But remember, you know, it depends how deep is that groundwater. Um, you know, do, do we have, have we uh, depleted our groundwater so much that it's so below our feet that we just like, um, only providing a very small amount of water going there. So maybe the volume uh, does matter, right? The other thing is if you have a small block of clay 
as you can imagine, not all, you know, soils is not just going to be entirely sand. If you have even a small bit of clay in your soils or a small bit of silt, that's great news because now these are the places which are going to work on that nitrate and not transmit it and transport it deeper into the groundwater. So the second question that we asked within our uh, work was, how much water do I apply? You know, what is the frequency? What is the amount of water that's needed? For how long do I need to flood my cropland? So we uh, looked at three different scenarios. The first was we'll apply all our water at once. We have 60 centimeter of water in our field. The second scenario was we are gonna split the 60 centimeter into four weeks. So we do one application of 17 centimeters per week. And last but not the least, we also did it like two applications for two weeks, what's gonna happen uh, to that nitrate and to our groundwater quality. So what we found again was the amount of nitrate that was lost to the atmosphere or to the groundwater was the most in this when we applied all the water at once. But it also provided the most nitrate transformations. Um, so again, as I said before, it depends how deep is your groundwater. So there is a bit of site selection here to find out what might be the most effective strategy for your particular soil. So numerical models can definitely answer those types of questions. So I'm going to quickly conclude. I know I'm like beyond my 15 minute time limit here. Uh, what we found here or what we worked on was how Agmar application choices are going to influence our groundwater quality with respect to nitrate. What we found was that finer textured soils such as silt or clay provide us really good nitrate control. And applying all the water at once was really preferable. I mean, our groundwater is really deep. It works much, much better than applying small amounts of water in incre incrementally over weeks. But again, you know, uh, depending upon individual site and soils, we can design what those ideal frequency and duration look like. So with that, I just want to thank the team that worked on this paper. Uh, we have it out. Uh, and thank you so much. Back to you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Bhavna, for that great presentation. Uh, we've got lots of questions for you in the Q&A from our audience members. So I'll start off with this first one. So this is a two-part question. So why is nitrate cons considered a contaminant in groundwater? And is that what causes algal blooms? Oh, really good question. Um, why is nitrate considered a contaminant in groundwater? So, it, you know, nitrate, if it's above 10 parts per million in our drinking water, it can cause different types of cancers, uh, but the most concerning is, you know, if um, if water, if that water with higher nitrate, especially for pregnant and nursing mothers, uh, that can cause blue ba baby syndrome. So that's what has defined our limits uh, on nitrate in our groundwater quality. And then, uh, does that cause algal blooms? Yes, it's part of what causes algal blooms. Phosphates are the other part of that equation. So anytime nitrate or phosphates are picked up from our croplands and you know that runoff, surface runoff happens, uh, you know, those definitely contribute to algal blooms in lakes and oceans. Thank you. And our next question is about uh, the Central Valley. So it sounds like Agmar is a good technique for growers in the Central Valley. Could you use some of these techniques in other parts of the country, for example, to uh, grow corn in the Midwest? Yes, absolutely. And they, they've they implemented Agmar all over the nation. So even, you know, you can think about uh, Ogallala Aquifer that spans across seven states, uh, mostly located in Texas, but they've implemented Agmar because, you know, you can think we are taking the water from groundwater out at such a quick rate, at a faster rate, then, you know, it's getting replenished. So our recharge, natural recharge is just so low and we're just taking the, the water out. It's not an infinite resource, as I said in my first slide, um, and they're implementing this everywhere. Again, you know, I, I think it brings back an important point that we have to be very careful in selecting the type of site 
where we apply Agmar and the soils, but they've been using it all over the nation for sure. Thank you. And does Agmar have any effects on uh, saltwater intrusion in coastal aquifers and can Agmar help stave off land subsidence? Um, yes, it does, because again, you know, what happens is if you have those uh, particles, right, let's go back to this, the previous figure, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what's happening is if you take that water out, you can imagine all the particles just sit at the bottom, right? There, nothing is holding them apart from each other. So that's what is causing land subsidence. And, uh, you know, we, we get seawater intrusion because we're pumping more groundwater out of the system and it's linked to our sea. So, you know, when, when we pump water, it's just pushing the seawater into our systems. So when we are doing the opposite, right, we are thinking about how do we fill up this, this resource back up? And so it's definitely providing, um, you know, uh, good things in preventing land subsidence and uh, seawater intrusion. Thank you so much for those thoughtful answers. And now let me ask everyone to rejoin us to kick off our Q&A session. Bhavna, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I will go ahead and ask Fede some of the questions that uh, appeared in the chat. Um, which minerals are likely to release water due to normal hydrothermal activity and which minerals can retain water and transport, transport them into the deep mantle? Um, and for the latter, how much water is actually retained? Um, I know you showed us a, a photo of that beautiful diamond, right? Um, yes. Are there um, other types of minerals? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. So I think the, the first thing is maybe like, to, to keep in mind is right essentially you know at least we think about minerals right is one thing that is very interesting is they're made of of the same you always have the same essentially the same chemical compositions the same uh, building blocks right but it, it's all it's all so they look differently and they have different properties depending on how those does does those chemical components are structured right so for example diamond and graphite have the same composition um, but as one, you know, as diamond is created at high pressures, um, it's you know, it looks completely different uh, than graphite, right? Um, so that's that's the first thing. And so what happens with with the with the with the Earth's crust is that as as you know, when you have the subduction zone, right? As the material um, as the crust goes down, it starts to experiment higher temperatures and pressures, so it starts to transform, right? So the mineral that we believe that it, it transport um, Quite a significant amount of water, meaning like up to like five percent, five seven percent. It's called serpentine, right? Um, but then, as you as you start to go deeper, you that that material. So first of all, the rock gets squeezed and heat up, so the water gets released. That's why you have volcanism near the subduction zone, um, and at the same time, the the, the the minerals get transformed into um, high pressure versions, right? And that's actually the same thing that happens. Uh, that's very interesting. If you so, if you think in terms of composition, actually the upper mantle and the transition zone, they have the same. Um, we we think in principle that they have the same composition, um, but they are just made of different minerals. The upper mantle is 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 made of a mineral called olivine that it can it cannot keep a lot of water in its structure, uh, whereas the transition zone is made of two minerals. One is called wasliate, and one another one is called ringwoodite. That we that essentially we know that the process, their structure can contain more more minerals in there. So what's, that's why the transition zone is a, we think is like a sponge, right? Because the and yes, so that's that's the reason. Um, so it's yeah, it's essentially yes, that's that's the main uh, idea. I see. Great. All right. Uh, hopefully. Um... I'll give you this. Maybe this is a softball question because that one seemed a lot more complicated, which was good. We're doing a lot of learning today. <laughs> so you mentioned that water is released when the plates move underneath each other. Then how is the water replaced? Well, that's uh, so let me. I can share the screen quickly again. That might be an easy. 
Yeah, sure, no and problem. And then easy thing. Just a second. This is a great screen question. Screen. It's actually really good. Uh, sorry, get in there. Technology. Uh, so yes, yeah, so as we're seeing, we're seeing here right in this. Ah, sorry about that. Let's go there. Um, so essentially, so we know that water gets out of the mantle, right? Essentially, in volcanically active regions, right? So in the essentially in volcanoes, in mid-ocean regions, that's how it gets out, right? Um, and the way it gets back in is to subduction zone. So that's that's the cycle essentially. That's the deep water cycle. Um, now, what we what we don't know yet, though, that's an open question, is how essentially how long does it take, for example, to the water to go from the transition zone to the upper mantle to get out, uh, right? But that's the so that, that that's the main idea. And the, the concept is that you know once the once the Earth's atmosphere was formed, the amount of water in the Earth has been constant, right? Either it's in the surface, or it's underneath, or it's in the mantle, but the, the total amount of water is, is constant. And you know, the one thing that is still an open question is actually how much water is underneath that's not in the mantle. And some people, you know, some studies they talk about the equivalent to one um, mass of the oceans, of all the oceans, whereas other studies talk about like three, four, five times, right? which is an interesting question because it means that you, know, if you can think that, oh, if actually if you would have all that water on the surface, it would mean that a lot of places they would actually, you know, the Netherlands and a lot of coastal places would actually be covered by, um, by water, right? Um, so the mantle is doing us a favor in that sense, keeping the water down there. So through time, the, the idea is that this amount of water has stayed pretty much more or less constant. Yes, that's what we think. Yes. Got us. Awesome. All right. We'll hand things back to Jocelyn and Baba. All right. So I know you mentioned. Uh, Grace imagery. How does the grace imagery work, and how can you imagine something underground? Yeah, this is uh, totally remote sensing, and what it's looking at is the change in water storage. So, remote sensing or satellite imagery, what you do is you you pass a signal and you see what's coming back to you. And there are algorithms uh, which will give you what is the change that's happening. So, it, you know, in simple terms, it's basically telling you how much was water there beneath our, you know, stored as groundwater. Um, and then how much has that changed over time? So you always look at trends rather than the absolute amount. Okay. And when it comes to recharging the aquifers, is there a way to, to avoid contaminating the aquifers by surface and subsurface pollution, such as fly ash and main tailings, along with agricultural pollution, such as pesticides or fertilizers? Sorry, could you say the first part again? Yes. So when it comes to recharging the aquifers, is there a way to avoid contaminating the aquifer by surface and subsurface pollution? No, that's that's the hardest part, right? Um, so there are different ways of, of doing the Agmar or the managed aquifer recharge. You could have these like large spreading basins uh, where like in Agmar, you're just like flooding these crop plants or these regions with water so that you know it's gonna that water is gonna trickle down through the soils into your groundwater. The other way, of course, is to do this connection, um, you know, have this connection and just have a deep well connecting your surface water and pumping that water into your groundwater. But, um, you know, what's in the soil there, whether it's arsenic contaminants or what's, what we have applied on the fields, uh, nitrates, fly ash, it's, it is going to get mixed with that water. And if it's not transformed within the soils because soils do act as natural filters to a lot of extent. Uh, so if it's not, if, if it doesn't get transformed within the soil, then it's going to end up in our groundwater. Okay. And is desalination a possible alternative to the use of groundwater in the future? It is. People are working on, de uh, you know, desalination techniques. It is quite costly 
at the moment and that's why it's not applied as much but yeah i mean there are so many people at berkeley lab working towards those techniques and bringing down the costs and are there any recent innovations in helping to locate underground aquifers uh, we know the aquifers and where they occur so okay yeah i hope that answers the question yeah and uh this next question is um are larger water harvesting wells and water treatment facilities being installed near rivers that undergo annual flooding uh say that again yes are large water harvesting wells and water treatment facilities being installed near rivers that undergo annual flooding? So there have been floods in the region, right? Um, that does happen. So again, you know, these groundwater resources more or less act as a reservoir. So, you know, we can put as much water in, but we also have to see what is the demand minus supply. And you know, are we really filling that up fully? Um, and and that's what Agmar is is trying to do is do this more sustainably. Uh, but yeah, these system exist. Uh, there is one in Kern uh, that I know of. There are you know our work in Modesto is also looking at these possibilities of doing Agmar systems. So what we have done is we'll have infiltration ponds definitely next to these rivers or lakes, uh, which are gonna bring in the water and then allow for this drainage to happen over uh, the farms. And again, this is more of an exercise right now where we're trying to see what the water quality looks like um, against the backdrop of these different sites in, in different regions. And again, it's going throughout the nation. This is this has been happening. Uh, on a completely different note, you know, there are questions also on the cost of maintaining some of these wells. And you know, are they getting obstructed and are they getting clogged? So there, there's a lot of um, techno economic analysis and uh, just a broad area of work that's being done in this field. Thank you. Indeed, you want to jump in? Yeah, up? sure. <laughs> Sure. Um, so does the relatively lower magnetic field strength that we see in the South Atlantic anomaly imply a lower mantle flow and thus a lower mantle water content? Not really, because okay. the so the, the essentially so the magnetic field um, is not generated in the mantle, but in the in the core. So actually, the, the core of so the earth is not exactly like a beach because the core has two pieces, right? There is there's the, the outer core and the inner core. The inner core is solid and the outer core is liquid. And it's essentially it's liquid metal that is moving, um, it's, it's moving very fast inside. Um, and so the, the magnetic field is actually generated in the, in the, inner, in the outer core, right? Um, and yeah, so we think that, uh, so this anomaly, this, this anomalous, uh, these strange values that we observe in the South Atlantic, they are related to the way the, the outer core is moving, but not necessarily the, the, what's happening in the mantle. The challenge that we have though, is that um, because the, you know, anomalous means that it's different from normal, right? Uh, so what happens is that the, the techniques that I've been using or that we are using for, to, study, to study changes in the magnetic field in North America and Europe and in Asia, they, they actually, they break when the magnetic field is uh, is so strange, it's so anomalous, uh, so we cannot use the same methods anymore. Um, so yeah, that's uh, so. Even though you know it's not related, it it is affecting how we can study the mantle there. Eddie, can you say anything about the water content stored under the surface on other planets? Um, yes, that's. Uh, uh, I mean. <laughs> That, that's a lot of uh that's a whole nother there, right? talk maybe exactly no <laughs> no no but what so what, what i can tell you is that what we so what we know is that um so mars has uh, earthquakes now that we've been recording them now with uh, with this nasa mission called insight uh, that is actually studying it's called, called marsquakes um 
And but those Mar those Mars quakes, they are not associated with plate tectonics. They are not, you know, there are no continents moving. There's no recent volcanic activity happening. So we think that, you know, at some point Mars used to have uh, plate tectonics, and at some point it stopped. Um, and we think that one of the reasons it stopped because it, the, the mantle ran out of water. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no water somewhere else, maybe in the crust, you know, but that's what we can know. And we have the same idea uh, about Venus. So we also think that uh, Venus doesn't no longer has plate tectonics and it has to do with that it doesn't have any water in the mantle. But that's as far as we can go, right? Because you know the, the challenge with um, when you're studying other planets is that you know for Earth we can go and you know, collect samples, install instruments, and make measurements. But we actually we have very little. You know, this is the first time we were. You know, two years ago was the first time we were recording earthquakes on, on Mars, right? So there's a lot actually to explore still. Um, so that is as far as I can I can tell you without entering into like <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So we're going to keep going with questions, but I know it's, people tend to um, drop off at one. So I want to get this question in before we proceed with the rest of the questions, just so we have any young scientists out there um, before they have to drop off at one. How did either of you or both of you um, individually get interested in the fields that you're in? What was the path that you took? Could you just explain a little bit about that for our audience? Bhavna, do you want to, do you want to go first or? You can go, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so for me, I have to confess, it was a beautiful set of random coincidences. Um, and, you know, the thing is when I was, when I was finishing my undergrad in Argentina, I was looking, I wanted to have the experience of living abroad. So I wanted to, and I wanted to, to, to do a PhD because it sounds fun to keep learning and, and keep uh, yeah, studying. Um, and so then I was shooting at places and then I found this, this person who, will, who wanted to study earthquakes, but on Mars, so Mars quakes. Um, so I applied for a PhD position with him. And in the middle of the interview process, actually, he told me that he also had a project to work on Earth. And you know, I, he took about the like, water in, in the Earth. And he was like, OK, that's, that's kind of strange. So then I just uh, I went there. But it was, really, um, it was really just random coincidence, I have to confess. I had no idea, before, even like during my undergrad, for example, I had no idea that there was actually water in the Earth's mantle. Um, so that was that was like that. And so yeah, your your desire to travel really brought you <laughs> brought you to this space, <laughs> brought you this yes. field. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and you know, and someone giving me a giving you a chance, right? Because right. um, that's true. You know, yeah, you're applying for these positions. You know, you shoot at places, you, you send applications to places, and you know, someone said, "Oh, this guy sounds interesting." Yeah. There's funding here. Let's figure out. Yes, that's exactly. Cool. That's where the funding yeah, is because that's where the questions are. I yeah. love it. All right, Bhavna, how about you? Yeah, so I'm uh, from an industrial town in India and um, we used to get water like uh, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. And I was, you know, as a child, I was just very curious about this management because they were routing our surface waters to these industries, which which needed it the most, and you know, I I was initially I I would be very upset that we don't have water anymore. Like everybody's just filling their buckets during the art in the morning and the art in the evening, and so that really got me into thinking. I need to think, you know, how can we best optimize and manage water resources, um, and you know, apply for an engineering school. Uh, you know, the only engineering school in in India which had the courses on water sources management and optimization. So that's how I kind of uh, got into the field and have not looked back. Of course, you know, with the DOE system, um, it has been interesting to think about more about contaminants and, um, you know, the legacies that we've left behind in soils and how uh, we might be impacting water quality. And now, of course, um, the talk is more towards um, you know, climate change stressors and how that's going to change our water story. So I guess I'm still on the same path. But yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the questions from the audience. So thank you so much for taking time to answer that. So Fede, what's actually happening in the 
deepest hole on earth? Why was it, why was it created? Is it still being used for something? Can you tell us a little bit more about the deepest hole on earth? Um, so yeah, so actually that, so that hole started in the fifties. It was in the, so it was started by the Soviet Union. Um, and it's kind of funny, it was actually, there was an equivalent, even though it's not so famous, there was an equivalent, um, it was the equivalent version of the space race. So essentially US and, and, and Russia they, and the Soviet Union back then, they had projects on, you know, trying to go as deep as possible in the Earth's interior to try to study it. Um, and I believe that it ran until the 90s, uh, until 1992. But then, yeah, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, essentially they ran out of funds, uh, so they stopped. Um, and also, but another point that is actually interesting is that apparently the Germans, they also had a project on that. So essentially there were three uh, big groups uh, doing that. And so now those three, so US had a project, Germany had a project and, and Soviet Union had a project and now the, the, the three of them stopped. But um, since a couple of years ago, there is, um, there is a collaboration between US, Japan and Europe actually to, to try again. Um, and, but and this time, instead of doing it in a, because in the case of the, 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 the Soviet um, hole, that was on a continent. Uh, so what they're going to try to do right now is they're going to dig in the oceans where the, where the, the crust is thinner. So it's only six kilometers thick uh, instead of, you know, 40. Um, um, so actually they are, they're now studying, um, I think they have like three candidates of uh, places, one in Costa Rica, um, there are two more I don't remember right now, I can just, uh, one in Costa Rica, one in Baja California, and one in Hawaii. Um, and so yeah, so hopefully, you know, soon there's going to be a, a, a essentially a ship, a platform that's going to study it. But you can imagine, you know, if you're trying to dig, because, you know, the places where the crust is the thinnest, it's also the places where the water column is the, is the thickest, right? So that comes with a lot of challenges. How do you keep, um, how do you keep the, you know, the, the platform? Of the machinery. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. one thing that is, is, is I found very, very interesting of, because someone might say, okay, what's the whole point? Of, you know, yeah, I was just going to say, right? is the point just to go deep? Well, so there are different things, right? So yeah. we, are, we are trying to get, um, samples of the mantle because it has never been so the only samples that we have are the ones that come because you know through volcanoes right um, so we never like went there and and, and collected a sample right uh, so that scientifically that's extremely interesting by itself um, but also you can see that there are a lot of technical challenges or technical sorry the technical challenges that you need to fix there's a lot of technology that need to be invented to do this right um, and that can you know potentially help uh, like daily life uh, situations, right? For example, a lot of the technology that was developed um, by the, Sher the Germans um, back in the 60s, at some point they became the standards on, on the gas and oil uh, industry nowadays. Um, so even though, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly curiosity what drives these, these endeavors, um, yeah, you don't know how it's going to, you know, affect society at, at the end. Yeah, exactly. And that your points um, lead to another great question we had in the chat, which is what can places like Yellowstone and Hawaii, which are very different, right? They're hot spots, So they're different than the, than plate tectonics and the rest of the, the earth. So how do these show us um, about the mantle transition zone and its water content? Are these special for that reason as well? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, a great question. And that's actually ongoing science, basically. Um, so the thing is, so we know that these so this, this hotspots, especially Hawaii, um, Hawaii um, they know, we know that they are, you know, they are, the, they are originated because of material that is, 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 is very, very deep in the mantle, in, in very deep in like the base of the mantle, you know, 3,000 kilometers deep, right? So it's like, you can think that there's a column of hot material that is coming up and is forming this island on the surface. Um, and then actually the, the main question in there is how does this you know, pile of, of this plume, we call them, of hot material, how does it interact with the transition zone and with the mantle as it goes up, right? Um, does it exchange material or not? Um, and so yeah, that's an, you know, an, an ongoing type of research. And actually that links to my, 
Um, so my postal project here at, uh, at UC Berkeley is we're trying to image uh, some of those uh, hotspots, some of those plumes in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, because what is not clear nowadays is how does this, yeah, this material that comes from very, very deep, it actually, when it reaches the surface, you know, how does it, how does it interact with what's happening on the surface? Right? In the sense that you, know, you can say, okay, you have something going up, but you also have these plates that are moving and that are deforming the material, you know, the mantle at the surface. So does the plume get you know, entrained? Uh, so uh, how do these processes interact? Essentially, it's not, a, it, it, it's not very clear. Right? Um, and then, yeah, if, if these plumes, if they sample the transition zone as they go through, that's, uh, that's a good question. And I don't think we have the answer yet. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Jocelyn, over to you to ask Bhavna some more questions. Yeah. So our next question is, uh, how many aquifers on the earth have a net negative change to climate change? Have a net negative change? I believe none. <laughs> um, you know, climate change is going to impact our groundwaters mostly through the recharge. So think of natural recharge. And, uh, you know, there was a great paper that was recently published that's talking about how our snowpacks are really diminishing. And a lot of that is rain. So if we don't have snowpack, you know, we're missing that recharge that's happening over those regions. And that, you know, that snow is melting. It's actually going underground, right, uh, to feed into the groundwater. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have more rains, most of that is runoff. There's also so much more uh, with higher temperatures, you can think we have much more evaporative losses. So that's also water that's not going underground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so all of our um, pointers or things that impact natural recharge, it's gonna impact how much groundwater is left. And on the human side of things, of course, you know, we have so much pumping that's going on um, and, and that's causing uh, for our resources to be dwindling. Um, a lot of the times, you know, we might think as off aquifers is something that are disconnected, but they're really connected to each other. So that's the other thing that you cannot think of aquifers as being isolated and not getting impacted by everything else that's happening with respect to climate change. And can an aquifer collapse permanently if too much water is pulled out? Yes, it can. Okay. So the next question is, is there any difference in the efficacy of Agmar used for principal aquifers versus glacial alluvial aquifers? Uh, for Agmar, um, it, it does depend upon aquifer properties, yes. I mean, it's gonna depend upon, again, you know, the person sands of clay. What if you have a clay confining layer? in between that it's going to prevent the recharge or it's going to slow down the recharge of your groundwater so much more. So yes, it's going to depend upon, um, you know, the types of soil, the type of minerals that are there. Um, yeah, all of that is going to factor into Agmar rates and, and how much uh, can we recharge. And in managed aquifer recharge, what conditions determine whether surface or underground recharge will be used? Yeah, again, it depends a lot on the type of soil you have, what, what you have in your soils, you know, are there surface contaminants that you want to absolutely prevent from entering your groundwater? Um, and, and for those reasons, you might just have a deeper connection uh, to the groundwater. So, so it's, yeah, it's totally going to be site dependent and so many parameters go into determining which is the best uh, managed aquifer recharge option. And I, I didn't quite say this, but, uh, you know, the cost of operation, the cost of maintenance also factor into uh, those solutions and, and what we ultimately choose. People in the Midwest have also like changed the type of crop they're, they're using. So they've moved away from corn, uh, you know, just because it requires so much water and we don't have like groundwater, um, depths were just so deep that it was hard to maintain the rates of uh, irrigation that were needed. 
So they're using Agmar to fill up the groundwater, but also moving away from those types of crop to you know, something that uses lesser water. Okay, and then this next question is about regulations. So what are the regulations concerning the injection of raw water and treated effluents into injection wells? Is that question to you? <laughs> Sorry, what are what are the regulations? Uh, so policy policy type of questions. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on that. I would say that even with Sigma, they have you know five other things that they want to ensure uh, beyond just saying we are doing sustainable groundwater management practices. So they want to ensure that there isn't land subsidence and that's just one of the parameters. I'm sure there's regulation, but I'm not a policy expert. So I'm not gonna try and answer that question. Okay. And then this question is about uh, aquifer pollutants. Uh, is there a chance that using surface water to recharge aquifer pollutes the aquifer? Um, I, I would think that our surface waters are relatively clean. We, we do have a lot of treatment. So, you know, when I showed that imagery uh, for surface water, they go through another cleaning process before being dumped on the farm or, so there is a treatment option. So beyond that, it's pretty clean to be putting, um, you know, that into our groundwaters if it's just more. We are talking about the managed aquifer recharge. All right, thank you guys so much. So I have, we'll do one more round of questions before we close this out. So Fede, somebody says, great talk. I was wondering how you can associate conductivity to water content alone, because conductivity also changes with pressure and impur impurities of other elements that may be present in the mantle material minerals. Yes, that's 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 totally that's that's I think that's Felipe. I, I noticed that. that in the <laughs> oh, <chat>. okay. <laughs> uh, and and that's a good question, and it's so true. So first of all, is so it is true that if you're um, if you're looking only at conductivity, right? Um, you cannot disentangle all these effects because as I was saying, so if you increase the temperature, um, the conductivity increases, uh, even for the same mineral. Uh, so that's why we, we need to combine these different techniques. So the idea is that we're using seismology, so the, the way, you know, the, how fast or slow the, the waves travel to, to get an idea of how temperature changes in the, in the Earth's mantle. And then, so we, we essentially constrained um, temperature use in seismology and um, then yeah so essentially for a given so for a given temperature if you know how deep you are you can calculate the pressure at which the rocks are going to be okay? and essentially you can use um, something called, called mineral physics to estimate um, what are the minerals that you have at those pressures and that particular temperature so if you have as we were talking before if you have olivine if you have ringwoodite osleite and what the amount of each mineral. Um, so then essentially we can, uh, once we know what minerals you have, uh, you can combine the conductivities of these different minerals um, and play with you know, how water affects each of them to try to match the, the observations. Um, as Felipe mentioned, it's true that there are, so there are always some, some effects that we are not uh, modeling. For example, the, the oxidation, so how much oxygen, how, 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 how oxidated the rocks are that also affects uh, the conductivity and that's something that we are not modeling right now and but you know how with with i think with, with what bagna is doing probably is the same at some point you know we are not we're trying to represent the earth with the best that we have right or the system with the best that we have so we always have some assumptions and limitations um but yeah essentially the link is that going back to, to the original question is that in order to disentangle these effects we need other techniques Right, um, and yeah, and so we use essentially seismology and also mineral physics to to disentangle those effects. But that's why it took me four years of my PhD uh, right. because you need to you need to understand the, the the funny thing when you're trying to combine this method is that you need to understand each method by itself um, to know how far you can push them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that just takes time. Mm -hmm. I, I lost this amount of hair uh, in the process. You know. <laughs> 
well, science thanks you <laughs> for sacrificing that hair. Um, so this sort of a, what you were just saying can lead us into our next question, question, which is really asking about like an analogy between using changes in the magnetic field of the earth during and earthquakes, right? During earthquakes and, and looking at the earthquake waves, is it like taking an MRI of the earth by moving the sample in the field by, you know, again, by using the earthquake itself? Well, so that's the case for uh, when you're looking at the, at the seismic waves, right? Okay. So when you, when, mm -hmm. Because when there's an earthquake, we record how the ground moves, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, Very and that's similar. Actually, yes, and yeah. that's actually what we what we use um, because and it's the same idea. You know, essentially you have, you know, you have a, an energy source, right? Mm -hmm. And that energy, so and you you're measuring how how long it takes to the energy to reach a certain point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right and and yeah, by looking at how long it takes, you can mm -hmm. you can get an idea of what the medium in which the mm -hmm. waves travel. In. For the magnetic field, actually, we are not really looking at changes that happen because of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually very hard to to measure. Mm -hmm. um, what we are looking at is this kind of interesting. It always kind of maybe funny to understand. It's actually we're looking at changes that happen to the magnetic field because of changes in the solar activity. So, you know, the, the, the sun has, so the sun is sending us light, but it's also sending us particles, charged mm -hmm. particles. And essentially when, when those, um, those particles, they interact with the magnetic field of the earth, you can think the magnetic field is like a shield around mm -hmm. the earth, right? You will kind of like compress a little bit the magnetic field you can think of. Mm -hmm. A little bit like, you know, when you think of uh, mm. Star Wars and they shoot at the, at the spacecraft and, and, and the, the thing deforms a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so actually we are looking at those, um, those because the idea is that, um, you know, changes in the, in the solar activity, they will deform our magnetic field and that will essentially generate a reaction uh, that has to do with the, with the Earth's mantle. I see. So you can actually, that's the thing that you're measuring. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. a proxy for what the magnetic field inside the earth is doing. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Well, that's, I, that's great. Um, so there's sort of two analogies taking place, um, the MRI yes. and then Star Wars analogy. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so. <laughs> okay, last question for us. Um, can we say that California earthquake probabilities will increase um, in wetter periods and decrease in prolonged drought periods, is that something that we can say as we're thinking about the relationship between water and um, plate tectonics? Not with what what I'm doing, right? Because right. I think what what we are you know what we are looking at is changes in you know changes that happen over millions of years, basically it's geologic time, whereas you know drowns and so water or, or drier periods they are more in a human time scale right um i don't know if there are people that there is i'm sure there might there must be people studying how um you know local effects such as the the change in the water load for example would affect this you know the stress field in a certain region and whether that can potentially trigger more or less earthquakes um but that's uh, th that's sort of too shallow for me. You know, anything that <laughs> happens below 50 kilometers for me is, is sort of like too shallow. Okay. Great. All right. We'll hand things over to Jocelyn Bhavna um, for our last few questions before we end up. So one of our audience member wants to know, do you know of any interesting research being done about fulvic or humic acids in, in, in groundwater? Yeah, I can send, I can share those papers, yes. Okay. So reach out to Bhavna, audience member that asked that question. And she can put them in the chat as well if you want, Bhavna. If that's something you can look up quickly, but if not, later. Yeah, later is good. <laughs> or email me and I can connect you. Uh, Jocelyn at lbl.gov. So this next question, um, someone asks, isn't clay also more prone to surface runoff? And someone responded, I think clay is negative, negatively charged, so it absorbs nitrates. Is that correct? 
No. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so in agricultural soils, I, I should rephrase that. So in agricultural soils, you do have this hard pan layer on top. Um, and, you know, that's going to change how much water is actually going in versus how much is run off from our soil. So we actually took all of that into account as we were doing these calculations. So the results you're getting are um, inclusive of those features for sure. Thank you for the clarification there. And I think I'll end on this last question here. So for home gardeners out there, could we use uh, sand or clay in our soil mixes to have some of these same Agmar benefits? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you're doing it, you know, urban landscapes are just so good because uh, you know, if you if you're do, don't do it in potted plants, that's that water is not going into your groundwater, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it in your home gardens, you know that's really great, especially urban landscapes. Like I said, what's happening with our water whenever it rains, you can you can think of it hitting just the pavement and just picking up all this debris and flowing out into the bay. So it's not actually going into our groundwater. So if home gardeners are out there, yes, please do. You know, that's a fantastic way to bring up our water tables. Thank you so much. And this brings us to the end of our event. Uh, before we close, I'd like just to thank Bhavna and Heather one more time for their presentations. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone, uh, all the audience members that tuned in and asked so many great questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them, um, but hopefully you can email me and I can get you the answer to those questions. Uh, so if you'd like to stay up to date on research coming out of our institutions, you can visit science at Cal at science at cal.berkeley.edu and Berkeley Lab at lpl.gov. And don't forget to tune into our next month's presentation which will focus on the science of meat and dairy alternatives on March 17th. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much um, to our speakers for their wonderful presentations and for answering the questions so eloquently. Thanks again, have a great day. Thanks everyone. Thank you.